Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the resurrected Cabal cult leader, Braid's Arisen Nightmare. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Braid's Arisen Nightmare is a 3-3 Nightmare that costs 1 in double black and has the following ability. On our upkeep, we may sacrifice an artifact, creature, enchantment, land, or planeswalker. If we do, each opponent may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with it. If they don't, that player loses 2 life and we draw a card. Breaking down her core stats, Braids is sporting a mid-size CMC, a typical stat block for her cost, and an interesting edict-like effect that either forces our opponents to give up their resources, or give us card advantage instead while they take damage. Diving deeper into this ability, it provides Braids with a unique combination of removal and card advantage that, unlike traditional edict removal that's typically limited to creatures, can be catered to target anything we want depending on how we build the deck, allowing us to focus on targeting specific kinds of permanents that would usually be outside our color's reach. And thanks to this customizable edict, depending on the permanents we want to focus on, Braids can easily put our opponents in a no-win situation, either forcing them to sack valuable permanents or give us card advantage, which will eventually become a non-choice as they run out of the chosen card type. So, as we can see, Braids is an interesting mix of removal and card advantage we can tailor to focus on particular types of permanents to maximize her effectiveness, which is why we'll be taking this build in an artifact-themed Aristocrats direction. With the core build having traditional Aristocrats pieces to take advantage of us sacking our own creatures for value, but also including a considerable amount of artifacts and non-creature artifact token creation to allow Braids to threaten our opponent's rocks and utility artifacts, forcing them to either sack them or give us card advantage to fuel our game plan even further. On the aristocrat side of things, we'll be running the usual suspects consisting of recurrable sack fodder we can easily recur or reanimate from our grave to be sacked over and over again, along with plenty of sack outlets to get them into the bin for value and death matters payoffs to get even more value or drain our opponents as we do so. Then in the artifact portion of the build, we'll be running a large number of non-creature artifact token generation in the form of treasure, food, and blood tokens for braids to turn into removal or draw without costing us any real resources, along with main deck artifacts with ETB and death triggers to net us even more value as braids sacks them away, and life draining artifacts matters payoffs to work alongside our aristocrats pieces to take down our opponent's life totals even faster. But that's enough of that, as Braids is getting sick of all this talking. It's been 200 years after all, and being stuck in her dementia space, being pulled apart and tortured by her greatest fears, and every single creature she ever killed got old after a few decades. But now she's finally back, resurrected and freed by the Cabal to lead them once more. Or at least lead the ones whose heads weren't blown up during the resurrection ritual. But first, there's a few planeswalkers across the table she wants to play with to test her new powers on. And I suspect she'll be having a lot more fun than they will. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we'll begin with a suite of self-reanimating sack fodder in the form of Persistent Specimen, Cult Conscript, and Blood-Soaked Champion, all of which can return themselves from the grave to the battlefield. The first being a 1-1 that costs 2 in a black to do so and comes back into play tapped, the second being a 2-1 that costs only 1 in a black to do so but only if a non-skeleton creature we control died that turn and always enters the battlefield tapped, and the last also being a 2-1 that costs 1 in a black to reanimate but only if a creature we control attacked that turn making them all dirt cheap creatures that hit the board early and we can easily sack over and over again for value. Gutter Bones then joins us as another recurrable creature, being a 2-1 that comes into play tapped, and lets us pay 1 in a black to return it from our grave to hand but only on our turn if an opponent lost life that turn, again making it a cheap body that we can repeatedly use to fuel our aristocrats game plan. Then we wrap up this lot with Disciple of the Vault, Forsworn Paladin, and Viscera Seer. Disciple of the Vault is a 1-1 that, whenever an artifact on the field is sent to the grave, has target opponents lose one life, enabling us to weaponize our artifact tokens for additional damage as we sack them away to Braid's ability or for their own. 
Forsworn Paladin is another 1-1, one -one, this time with Menace, that lets us pay 1 a black, tap it and pay 1 life to create a treasure token, in addition to letting us pay 2 and a black to give target creature plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn, as well as death touch if mana from a treasure was used to pay for this ability. Serving as a cheap source of treasure tokens in the early game to enable braids, and later allowing our sack fodder to trade with anything so long as we have the treasure to pump into them. Viscera Seer is yet another 1-1, one -one, this time letting us sack a creature to scry 1, providing the build with a free sack outlet to trigger our Death Matters payoffs, and whose card selection helps smooth out our draws throughout the course of the game. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we have some more self-reanimators joining our ranks with Reassembling Skeleton, Nether Trader, and Tenacious Underdog, which again are all able to return themselves to the field from the graveyard, the first being a 1-1 one -one that costs 1 in a black to do so and comes back into play tapped, the second being a 1-1 one -one with Haste and Shadow that costs a black to reanimate but only when another creature from our field is sent to the graveyard, and the last being a 3-2 that lets us pay its blitz cost of 2 double black and 2 life to cast it from our grave, all of which give us even more bodies to sack for value over and over again. Dogged Detective then gets added in as yet another self-recurring creature, being a 2-1 that surveils 2 when it ETBs and returns itself from the grave to our hand whenever an opponent draws their second card for turn, its recursion condition being very easily met if our opponents are running any sort of draw, and its ETB surveil providing us with both additional card selection and graveyard setup. It's then on to a suite of Death Matters payoffs as we move deeper into this lot with Blood Artist, Zulaport Cutthroat, and Voldaren Bloodcaster. Blood Artist is a 0-1 that, whenever it or another creature dies, has target opponent lose one life while we gain one life, providing our build with a staple Aristocrat's payoff in the form of Life Drain as both our and our opponent's creatures die off. Zulaport Cutthroat is a 1-1 that, whenever a creature we control dies, has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, like the previous entry, giving us more access to Life Drain effects to bring down our opponent's life totals while increasing our own as we sack away our creatures for value. Voldaren Bloodcaster is a 2-1 flyer that, whenever it or another creature we control dies, creates a blood token, and whenever we create a blood token, if we control 5 plus blood tokens, transforms into Bloodbat Summoner. A 3-3 flyer that, at the start of our combat phase, turns a blood token we control into a 2-2 bat with flying in haste, which will be primarily running for its front phase as an easy to trigger source of blood tokens for braids to sack or for us to use for card selection and graveyard setup. Then closing out this slot, we have Priest of the Forgotten Gods, a 1-2 that we can tap and sack two creatures to have any number of target players lose two life and sack a creature, while we generate two black mana and draw a card, making it a free once per turn sack outlet to trigger our death payoffs that both hurts our opponents with its edict removal and burn, while simultaneously providing us value in the form of ramp and card advantage. The CMC3 slot then continues on the sack outlet trend with Skullport Merchant, Ruthless Knave, and Ayara First of Lockthwain. Skullport Merchant is a 1-4 that creates a treasure when it ETBs and lets us pay 1 a black and sack either a creature or treasure to draw a card. It's one-shot treasure creation helping set up Braid's artifact edict removal in the early game, and later turning into a reasonable sack outlet for our creatures and most common token. Ruthless Knave is a 3-2 that lets us pay 2 a black and sack a creature to create 2 treasures, in addition to letting us sack 3 treasures to draw a card, serving as a decent way to turn our sack fodder into artifacts for our commander to use or turn excess treasures into draw if needed. Ayara is a 2-3 that, whenever a black creature ETBs under our control, has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, and lets us tap her and sack a black creature to draw a card, taking full advantage of our mono black deck by providing AoE drain as our creatures come down, while also serving as a free sack outlet once per turn to keep our hands topped off and proc our death matters payoffs. We then have some one-shot sack effects joining our ranks with Plague Crafter, Demon's Disciple, and Grave Lighter, all of which have each player sack a creature when they ETB, the first being a 3-2 that has a player discard a card if they can't sack a creature, the second being a 3-1 that can also hit planeswalkers, and the last being a 2-2 flyer that, if a creature died that turn, draws a card instead, all providing our build with solid AoE edict removal to disrupt our opponent's boards while proccing our payoffs. It's then back onto Death Matters payoffs in the form of Grim Haro Specs, Morbid Opportunist, and Undercity Scrounger. The first being a 3-2 with Morph for a black that draws us a card whenever a non-token creature we control dies, the second being a 1-3 that draws us a card whenever any creature dies, limited to once per turn, and the last being a 1-4 that lets us tap it to create a treasure token but only if a creature died that turn, all padding our build's core stats with their card advantage and ramp respectively as our creatures die off or are sacked for value. 
Nadir's Nightblade then gets slotted in as another payoff, being a 1-3 that, whenever a token we control leaves the battlefield, has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, this time taking advantage of our multiple sources of artifact token creation to tack on some AoE drain as we use them up. And finally, we close out this slot with Falconrath Forbear, a 1-3 flyer that can't block and, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, creates a blood token, in addition to letting us pay a black and sack two blood tokens to return it back into play from our graveyard, making it both a repeatable source of artifact token generation and recurrable sack fodder provided we're able to stockpile the blood it creates. Entering the CMC4 slot, we start off with Falconrath Noble and Vindictive Vampire, both of which are Death Matters payoffs, the former being a 2-2 flyer that, whenever it or another creature dies, has target player lose one life while we gain one life, and the latter being a 2-3 that, whenever another creature we control dies, deals one damage to each opponent and gains us one life making them bigger versions of Blood Artist and Zulaport Cutthroat respectively that, like their predecessors, help us pile on the damage as we stick to our Aristocrats game plan. The legend Gisa Glorious Resurrector then also joins our ranks, being a 4-4 that, whenever an opponent's creature would die, exiles it instead and, on our upkeep, puts all creatures exiled with her into play under our control with Decayed. Working very well with Braids to make our opponent's choice even harder once we start sacking our creatures to her effect, forcing them to give us any creatures they sack if they refuse to let us draw. And Solemn Simulacrum then closes out this lot, being a 2-2 that, when it ETBs, puts a basic land from our deck into play tapped, and, when it dies, draws us a card, working well as sack fodder that ramps us on the way in and replaces itself on the way out. Proceeding to the CMC5 slot, we have the legend Sir Conrad the Grim and Turgrid God of Fright joining us as its only entrance. Sir Conrad is a 5-4 that, whenever another creature dies, is put into a graveyard from anywhere or leaves our graveyard, deals one damage to each opponent, in addition to letting us pay one in a black to mill each player for one, giving us access to yet another death payoff that this time also dings our opponents as our sack fodder recurs or reanimates itself as well. Turgrid is an MDFC whose front face is a 4-5 that, whenever an opponent sacks or discards a permanent, lets us put it into play under our control from their graveyard and whose back face, Turgrid's Lantern, costs 3 and a black and lets us tap it to have target player lose 3 life unless they sack a non-land permanent or discard a card in addition to letting us pay 3 and a black to untap it, again synergizing very well with braids to steal away our opponent's resources if they refuse to let us draw. Nearing the end now, the CMC6 slot brings us its lone entrance, Marionette Master, a 1-3 with Fabricate 3 that, whenever an artifact we control is put into the graveyard from play, has target opponent lose life equal to Marionette Master's power, which will usually be turning into a 4-6 with its Fabricate 3 to really pile on the damage as our artifacts go to the bin. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot and our last creature, we have Butcher of Malakir, a 5-4 flyer that, whenever it or another creature we control dies, has each opponent sack a creature, giving our build access to repeatable AoE Edict removal that pairs very well with our self-sacking game plan. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, the first half brings us to File, which has target creature lose minus one minus one for each swamp we control until end of turn, serving as a cheap but effective form of non-destruction based removal that works well with our mono-colored build. The second half of this slot then brings us Village Rights, which has a sack a creature to draw to, making it a no-frill sack effect that helps us keep our hands full while procking our death payoffs in the process. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, leading off with another sack effect, Deadly Dispute, which lets a sack an artifact or creature to draw two and create a treasure. Like Village Rites before it, working as a staple source of draw for us, this time leaving some treasure behind for Braids to use as a bonus. We then have Go for the Throat and Infernal Grasp as our last two instants, both of which destroy target creature, the former costing us two life to use and the latter being limited to non-artifact creatures, providing us with some solid removal in our colors to deal with most problematic creatures we may encounter. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. It's going to be single slots all the way down in this category, beginning in the CMC2 slot with Feed the Swarm, which destroys target creature or enchantment an opponent controls, and then has a lose life equal to its CMC, its ability to deal with enchantments, which Mono Black is notoriously bad at, still making it worth running despite its low speed and life loss. The CMC3 slot then brings us Pointed Discussion, which has us draw two, lose two life, and create a blood token, making it a decent draw effect that again leaves behind an artifact token for us to use with braids to continue pressuring our opponent's artifacts. 
And finally, reaching the CMC 4 slot in our last sorcery, we have Make an Example, which has each opponent separate all their creatures into two piles, letting us choose a pile for each of them and having them sack the creatures in the selected pile, serving as a decent partial wipe to get rid of the biggest creature threats on each opponent's board and bypassing most forms of defense they may possess. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we have its only entrance, Underhanded Designs, which lets us pay one whenever an artifact ETBs under our control to have each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, in addition to letting us pay one, a black and sack it to destroy target creature if we control two plus artifacts. Adding on some reasonably costed AoE drain to the build that works well with our artifact token creation to get extra damage in while also being usable as removal in a pinch. Then reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our final pair of enchantments with Agent of the Iron Throne and Bastion of Remembrance, both of which are Death Matters payoffs, the former being a background that, whenever an artifact or creature we control is put into our graveyard from the field, has each opponent lose one life so long as we control our commander, and the latter creating a 1-1 when it ETBs and has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life whenever a creature we control dies, providing our build with even more AoE drain to deplete our opponent's life totals even further. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we start off with the Ramp Source's Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble. The former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, each helping speed up our mana base and, if we find ourselves with a surplus of mana in the mid to late game, can instead be used by braids to turn them into removal or card advantage. Then we wrap up this slot with the token creating artifacts Currency Converter, the Underworld Cookbook, and Witch's Oven. Currency Converter, whenever we discard a card, gives us the option to exile it and either let us pay to and tap it to draw and discard a card, or instead tap it and return a card exiled by it back to the graveyard, creating a 2-2 rogue if it's a non-land and a treasure if it's a land, allowing us to get extra treasure generation out of our excess lands once Braid starts overdrawing us and, since it's a May trigger, also serving as a decent loot effect to pitch self-reanimating creatures to our bin to dig further into our deck. The Underworld Cookbook lets us tap it and discard a card to create a food token, or pay 4, tap it and sack it to return target creature from our graveyard back to hand, again giving us another way to turn our excess cards into artifact tokens while also serving as a way to recur our Death Matters creatures if they get removed. Witch's Oven lets us tap it and sack a creature to create a food token, or two food tokens instead if the sacked creature has 4 plus toughness, serving as another free once per turn sack outlet and source of artifact tokens for our commander to sack, which helps both the aristocrats and the artifact sides of our build. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, starting off with the Mana Rocks, Arcane Signet, Liqui Metal Torque, and Thought Vessel. The first tapping for any color in our commander's color identity to help speed up our mana base, the second tapping for a colorless or instead tapping to turn target non-land permanent into an artifact until the end of the turn, which again serves as a solid rock with the added benefit of temporarily turning any of our sack fodder into artifacts to benefit both from our aristocrats and artifact payoffs, and the last also tapping for a colorless and removing our maximum hand size limit, which works well with the potential 3 cards a turn braids can draw for us to prevent us from having to discard down to hand size each turn. From there, it's on to a suite of artifacts with both ETB and Graveyard Triggers, starting with Nimble Rite Schematic and Servo Schematic, both of which create a 1-1 artifact token when they ETB and go to the grave, Pry Statue, which creates a treasure instead on ETB and Destruction, and Iker Wellspring and Mycosynth Wellspring, the former drawing us a card, and the latter putting a basic land from our deck into our hand when they ETB or are sent to the bin. All being cheap artifacts, we can sack the Braids for removal or card advantage, all while getting value out of them as they enter and leave the battlefield. We then close out this slot with Noble's Purse, Stryonic Resonator, and Swiftfoot Boots. Noble's Purse comes into play tapped with three coin counters on it and lets us tap it and remove a coin counter from it to create a treasure token. On its own, providing braids with four artifacts to sack while also being usable as ramp if we need the extra mana. Stryonic Resonator lets us pay to and tap it to copy target triggered ability we control, letting us choose new targets for the copy, allowing Braids to double up on our Edict Removal to disrupt our opponent's boards even further or allow us to draw up to 6 cards a turn, either of which are spectacular for us. Swiftfoot Boots is an equipment that equips for 1 and grants the equipped creature Hexproof and Haste, giving Braids or our other creature payoffs decent targeted removal protection to help keep them alive for longer. Closing in on the end now, the CMC3 slot brings us its two entrants, Decanter of Endless Water and Bantu's Monument. 
Decanter of endless water taps for any color and removes our maximum hand size limit. Serving as another rock that lets us stockpile all the cards that braids can draw for us, this time tapping for colored mana as well. Bantu's Monument reduces the cost of all our black creatures by one, and whenever we cast a creature spell, has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, reducing the cost of most of our creature base, while giving us another AoE life drain source to suck the life right out of our opponents as we cast them. And finally, reaching the CMC 4 slot, we have our last artifact with Trading Post, which we can pay 1 in tap for the following abilities. Discard a card to gain 4 life, pay 1 life to create a 0-1 token, sack a creature to return an artifact from our grave back to hand, or sack an artifact to draw a card. Providing the build with a bit of everything in the form of tokens to sack, sack outlets for our creatures and artifacts, and even a way to pitch our excess cards to pad our life totals if we really need to. That covers all our artifacts, and since we have no planeswalkers in this build, let's move straight to our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we only have a single entrance, Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless, and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped, providing us with some decent land-based ramp from our land slot. Then moving on to our utility lands, we'll be running Bajuga Bog, Drown Yard Temple, and Reliquary Tower. Bajuga Bog comes into play tapped, taps are a black, and exiles target player's graveyard when it ETBs, making it a decent source of graveyard hate from the land slot that still generates mana of our color. Drownyard Temple taps for a colorless and lets us pay 3 to return it from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped, making it an interesting option to sack with braids to threaten our opponent's land base which we can get right back into play to sack again. Reliquary Tower also taps for a colorless and removes our maximum hand size limit, giving us yet another way to hoard all the cards we draw off braids and our other aristocrats draw engines and, since it makes our rocks that do this redundant, frees them up to be sacked by braids if we don't need the mana anymore. And lastly, we're running 31 swamps as our basics to close out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 36 creatures including the Commander, 5 Instants, 3 Sorceries, 3 Enchantments, 18 Artifacts, 0 Planeswalkers, and 35 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 9 creatures that can either reanimate or recur themselves, 13 Sack Effects and Outlets, 14 Death Matters Payoffs, 14 Sources of Life Drain, 11 Sources of Non-Creature Artifact Creation, 6 Artifacts with both ETB and Death Triggers, and 4 cards that care about artifacts, giving us plenty of cards that work nicely with the traditional Aristocrats portion of our build in the form of recurrable Sack Fodder, Sack Outlets, and Payoffs, as well as a decent number of Artifact-centric cards to work with the Braid's Artifact-focused portion of the build, providing her with Artifact Tokens and Value-focused Artifacts for her to Sack, with both portions having a decent number of Life Drain effects between them to whittle down our opponent's life totals. For general deck stats, we have 18 Ramp Sources, 12 Card Draw Sources, 10 Targeted Removal Sources, and 1 Board Wipe our ramp being very high in this build due to our primary artifact token generators producing treasures, while our other stats fall within more typical ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 14 1 drops, 24 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 5 4 drops, 2 5 drops, 1 6 drop, and 1 7 drop, leaving us with a fairly aggressive curve that wants to drop cheap artifacts or create artifact tokens early, followed up by braids to sack them away to force our opponents to either lose their rocks or let us draw cards, allowing us to dig deeper into our deck for our aristocrats pieces and set them up at breakneck pace. Currently, this deck is valued at 6482, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, more edict effects on bodies such as Merciless Executioner and Fleshbag Marauder would be good additions to help keep our opponent's boards clear. Woe Strider, Vampiric Rites, and Bantu the Glorified are all solid sack outlets to provide the build with even more ways to turn our creatures into value. And Grey Merchant of Asphodel is of course another great addition for its potentially massive AoE drain as it comes down. For upgrades, Massacre Worm is a solid mini-wipe and source of repeatable life loss for our opponents as their creatures die off on a huge body. Bloodgast is a superb self-reanimating creature that keeps coming back as we make our land drops. Revel in Riches and Pitiless Plunderer make for fantastic sources of treasure generation to ramp us or sack to our commander. And Dictate of Erebos and Grave Pact are both incredible death matters payoffs that help keep our opponent's boards clear of creatures as we sack our own turn after turn. 
And finally, the Meat Hook Massacre makes for a solid scalable board wipe and potent death matters payoff that keeps sucking the life from our opponents as well as patting our own as creatures die off. Though expect to pay top dollar for this butcher's services and try not to ask where the meat from this massacre came from exactly. Trust me, you don't want to know. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to take a moment to thank the channel subscribers for helping the channel reach its 7.2k subscriber milestone. This channel's growth has all been thanks to your continued support, so thank you for getting us to this point and hopefully keep us growing in the future. Then taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like Tetsuo's impeccable swordsmanship and spellcasting were enough to claim him the top spot, so look forward to an equipment-heavy spellslinger build featuring him next week. Moving on to this week's poll, we have a set of 1, 2, and 3 color legendaries for you folks to vote on, with this week's contenders being Limduel's Mono Black Alter Ego The Raven Man, the completed Demir Merfolk, Vohar Vodalian Desecrator, and the band's descendant of Captain Sisse herself, Shauna Purifying Blade. Please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Dominaria United in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank Kianfi for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Kianfi, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.